This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Clark. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 40. The Breakfast. What sort of a person do you expect to breakfast? said Beecham. A gentleman and a diplomatist. And we shall have to wait two hours for the gentleman and three for the diplomatist. I shall come back to dessert. Keep me some strawberries, coffee and cigars. I'll take a cutlet on my way to the chamber. Do not do anything of the sort, for with the gentleman of Montmorency and the diplomatist of Metternich, we will breakfast at eleven. In the meantime, follow De Bray's example and take a glass of sherry and a biscuit. Be it so, I'll stay. I must do something to distract my thoughts. You are like De Bray, yet it seems to me that when the minister is out of spirits, the opposition ought to be joyous. Ah, uh, you do not know with what I'm threatened. I shall hear this morning that Monsieur Danglars made a speech at the Chamber of Deputies, and at his wife's this evening I shall hear the tragedy of a peer of France. The devil take the constitutional government, and since we had our choice, as they say, at least, how could we choose that? I understand, you must lay in a stock of hilarity. Do not run down Monsieur Danglars' speeches, said Debray. He votes for you and he belongs to the opposition. Ah, pardieu, that is exactly the worst of all. I am waiting until you send him to speak at the Luxembourg to laugh at my ease. My dear friend, said Albert to Beecham, it is plain that the affairs of Spain are settled, for you are most desperately out of humour this morning. Recollect that Parisian gossip has spoken of a marriage between myself and Mademoiselle Eugène Danglars. I cannot in conscience, therefore, let you run down the speeches of a man who will one day say to me, Vicomte, you know that I gave my daughter two millions. Ah, this marriage will never take place, said Beecham. The king has made him a baron and can make him a peer, but he cannot make him a gentleman, and the Count of Morsef is too aristocratic to consent for the paltry sum of two million francs to a misalliance. The Viscount of Morsef can only wear a marchioness. But two million francs make a nice little sum, replied Morsef. It's the social capital of a theatre on a boulevard or a railroad to the Jardin de Plantes in Lerapie. Never mind what he says, Morsef, said Debray. Do you marry her? You marry a money bag label, it's true. But what does that matter? It's better to have a blazon less and a figure more on it. You have seven martlets on your arms. Give three to your wife and you'll still have four. That's one more than Monsieur de Guise had, who so nearly became King of France and whose cousin was Emperor in Germany. On my word, I think you're right, Lucian, said Albert absently. To be sure, besides, every millionaire is as noble as a bastard. That is, he can be. Do not say that to Bray, returned Beecham, laughing. For here is Chateau Renard, who, to cure you of your mania for paradoxes, will pass the sword of Renard de Montbaton, his ancestor, through your body. He'll sully it then, replied Lucian, for I'm low, very low. Oh, heavens, cried Beecham. The minister quotes Baranga. What then shall we come to next? Monsieur de Chateau Renard, Monsieur Ch Maximilien Morel, said the servant, announcing two fresh guests. Now then, to breakfast, said Beecham. For, if I remember, you told me you only expected two persons, Albert. Morel, muttered Albert. Morel, who is he? But before he'd finished, Monsieur de Chateau Renard, a handsome young man of thirty, gentlemen all over, that is, with the figure of a guiche and the wit of a Montmartre, took Albert's hand. My dear Albert, said he, let me introduce you to Monsieur Maximilien Morel, captain of Saphis, my friend, and what's more, however the man speaks for himself, my preserver. Salute my hero, Viscount. And he stepped on one side to give place to a young man of refined and dignified bearing, with a large and open brow, piercing eyes, and a black moustache, whom our readers have already seen at Marseilles under circumstances sufficiently dramatic not to be forgotten. A rich uniform, half French, half Oriental, set off his graceful and stalwart figure, and his broad chest was decorated with the Order of the Legion of Honour. The young officer bowed with easy and elegant politeness. Monsieur, said Albert with affectionate courtesy, the Count of Chateau Renard knew how much pleasure this introduction would give me. You are his friend, be ours also. Well said, interrupted Chateau Renard, and pray that, if you should ever be in a similar predicament, he may do as much for you as he did for me. 
What's he done? asked Albert. Oh, nothing worth speaking of, said Morel. Monsieur Chateau Renard uh, exaggerates. Not worth speaking of, cried Chateau Renard. Life is not worth speaking of. That is rather too philosophical. On my word, Morel, it is very well for you who risk your life every day, but for me, who only did so once, we gather from this, Baron, that Captain Morel saved your life. Exactly so. On what occasion? asked Beecham. Beecham, my good fellow, you know that I'm starving, said Debray. Do not set him off on some long story. Well, I do not prevent your sitting down to table, replied Beecham. Chateau Renard can tell us while we eat our breakfast. Gentlemen, said Morsef, it's only a quarter past ten and I expect someone else. Ah, a true diplomatist, observed Debray. Diplomat or not, I don't know. I only know that he's charged himself on my account with a mission which he terminated so entirely to my satisfaction that had I been king, I should have instantly created him a knight of all my orders, even if I'd been able to offer him the golden fleece and the garter. Well, since we are not to sit down to table, said Debray, take a glass of sherry and tell us all about it. You all know that I had a fancy of going to Africa. It's a road your ancestors have traced out for you, said Albert gallantly. Yes? <laughs> but I doubt your object was like theirs, to rescue the Holy Sepulchre. You're quite right, Beecham, observed the young aristocrat. It was only to fight as an amateur. I cannot bear duelling since two seconds, chosen to arrange an affair, forced me to break the arm of one of my best friends, one whom you all know, poor Franz d'Epinay. Ah, true. You did fight some time ago, said Debray. About what? The devil take me if I can remember, returned Chateau Renard. But I recollect perfectly one thing, that being unwilling to let such talents as mine sleep, I wished to try upon the Arabs the new pistols that had been given to me. In consequence, I embarked for Oran, uh, and went thence to Constance, where I arrived just in time to witness the raising of the siege. I retreated with the rest for eight and forty hours. I endured the rain during the day and the cold during the night tolerably well, but on the third morning my horse died of cold. The poor brute, accustomed to being covered up and to have a stove in the table, the Arabian finds himself unable to bear ten degrees of cold in Arabia. That's why you wanted to purchase my English horse, said Debray. You think you'll bear the cold better? You are mistaken, for I have made a vow never to return to Africa. You are very much frightened, then? asked Beecham. Well, yes, and I had a good reason to be so, replied Chateau Renard. I was retreating on foot, for my horse was dead. Six Arabs came up, full gallop, to cut off my head. I shot two with my double-barrel gun, and two more with my pistols. But I was then disarmed, and two were still left. One seized me by the hair. That's why I wear it so short. Uh, no one knows what may happen. The other swung a yatagan, and I already felt the cold steel on my neck when this gentleman who you see here charged them, shot one who held me by the hair, and cleft the skull of the other with his sabre. He had assigned himself the task of saving a man's life that day, and Chance caused that man to be myself. When I am rich, I will order a statue of Chance from Clagmanon or Mariachetti. Yes, said Morel, smiling. It was the 5th of November, uh, the anniversary of the day which my father was miraculously preserved. Therefore, as far as it lies within my power, I endeavour to celebrate it by some heroic action, interrupted Chateau Renard. I was chosen, but that's not all. After rescuing me from the sword, he rescued me from the cold, not by sharing his cloak with me, like St. Martin, but giving me the whole. Then, from hunger, by sharing with me, guess what? A Strasbourg pie, asked Beecham. No, his horse, of which each of us ate a slight with a hearty appetite. It, it was very hard. The horse, asked Morsef, laughing. No, the sacrifice, returned Chateau Renard. Ask De Bray if he would sacrifice his English steed for a stranger. Not for a stranger, said De Bray. But for a friend I might, perhaps. I divined that you would become mine, Count, replied Morel. Besides, uh, as I had the honour to tell you, heroism is not, sacrifice or not, the day I owed an offering to bad fortune in recompense for favours good fortune had on other days granted us. The history to which Monsieur Morel alludes, continued Chateau Renard, is an admirable one, for which he will tell you some day when you are better acquainted with him. Today, let us fill our stomachs and nut our memories. What time do you breakfast, Albert? At 
half past ten. Precisely? Asked Debray, taking out his watch. Oh, you'll give me five minutes, Grace, replied Morsef, for I also expect to preserve her. Of whom? Of myself, cried Morsef. Pablo, do you think that I cannot be saved as well as anyone else, and that there are only Arabs who cut off heads? Our breakfast is a philanthropic one, and we shall have at table, at least, I hope so, two benefactors of humanity. What, what shall we do? said Debray. We only have one Monthian prize. Well, it will be given to someone who has done nothing to deserve it, said Beecham. That's the way the Academy mostly escapes from the dilemma. And where does he come from? asked Debray. You have already answered the question once, but so vaguely that I venture to put it a second time. Really, said Albert. I do not know. Uh, when I invited him three months ago, he was then at Rome. But since that time, who knows where he may have gone? And you think him capable of being exact? demanded Debray. I think him capable of everything. Well, with the five minutes grace, we only have ten left. I will profit by them to tell you something about my guest. I beg pardon, interrupted Beecham, but are there any materials for an article which you're going to tell us? Yes, and for a most curious one. Go on, then, for I see that I'm not going to make it to the chamber this morning. I must make up for it. I was at Rome last carnival. We know that, said Beecham. Yes, but what you do not know is that I was carried off by bandits. Oh, there are no bandits, cried Debray. Yes, there are, and most hideous, or rather, most admirable ones. I found them ugly enough to frighten me. Come, my dear Albert, said Debray. Confess that your cook is behind hand, that the oysters haven't arrived from Ostend or Marinus, and that, like Madame de Maintbaton, you are going to replace the dish by a story. So say at once, we are sufficiently well-bred to excuse you and to listen to your history, fabulous as it promises to be. And I say to you, fabulous as it may seem, that I tell a true one from beginning to end, the brigands that carried me off and conducted me to a gloomy spot called the Catacombs of St. Sebastian. I know it, said Chateau Renard. I narrowly escaped catching a fever there. And I did more than that, replied Morsef, for I caught one. I was informed that I was prisoner until I paid the sum of 4,000 Roman crowns, about uh, 24,000 francs. Unfortunately, I had not above 1,500. I was at the end of my journey and of my credit. Uh, I wrote to France, and were he here, he would confirm every word. I wrote then to France that if he did not come with 4,000 crowns before six, at 10 minutes past, I should have gone to join the blessed saints and glorious martyrs in whom the company I had the honour of being, and Signor Luigi Vampa, such was the name of the chief of these bandits, would have scrupulously kept his word. But Franz did come with the 4,000 crowns, said Sato Renard. A man whose name is Franz de Epinay or Albert de Morcef has not much difficulty in procuring them. No, he arrived accompanied simply by the guest I'm going to present to you. Ah, this gentleman is a Hercules killing Cacus, a Perseus freeing Andromeda. No, he is a man about my own size. Armed to the teeth? Uh, he had not even a knitting needle, but he paid your ransom. He said two words to the chief, and I was free. And they apologised to him for having carried you off, said Beecham. Just so. Why, he is a second Ariosto. No, his name is the Count of Monte Cristo. There is no Count of Monte Cristo, said Debray. I don't think so, said Chateau Renard, with the air of a man who knows the whole of the European nobility perfectly. Does anyone know anything of a Count of Monte Cristo? He comes possibly from the Holy Land, and one of his ancestors possessed Calvary, uh, as the Mortmarts did the Dead Sea. I think I can assist your researchers, said Maximilian. Monte Cristo is a little island I have often heard spoke of by the old sailors my father employed. A grain of sand in the centre of the Mediterranean, an atom in the infinite. Precisely, cried Albert. Well, he whom I spoke is the lord of the, and master of this grain of sand, of this atom. Uh, he has purchased the title of Count somewhere in Tuscany. He's rich then? I believe so. But that ought to be visible. That's what deceives you, Debray. I don't understand you. Have you read The Arabian Nights? What a question. Well... Do you know if the person you see 
there are rich or poor if their sacks of wheat are not rubies or diamonds. They seem like poor fishermen, and then suddenly they open some mysterious cavern filled with the wealth of the Indies. Which means, which means that my Count of Monte Cristo is one of those fishermen. He even had a name taken from the book, since he calls himself Sinbad the Sailor, and has a cave filled with gold. And you've seen this cavern, Morsef? asked Beecham. No, but Franz has. For heaven's sake, not a word of this before him. Franz went in with his eyes blindfolded, and was waited on by mutes, and by women whom Cleopatra was a painted strumpet. Only he is not quite sure about the women, for they did not come in until after he had taken hashish. So what he took for a woman might simply have been a row of statues. <laughs> the two young men looked at Morsef as if to say, Are you mad or are you laughing at us? And I also, added Morel thoughtfully, have heard something like this from an old sailor named Penelon. Ah, cried Albert, it is very lucky that uh, Monsieur Morel has come to aid me. You are vexed, are you not, that he has thus given a clue to the labyrinth? My dear Albert, said Debray, what you tell us is extraordinary. Ah, and because your ambassadors and your consuls do not tell you of them, they have no time. They are too much taken up with interfering in the affairs of their countrymen who travel. Now you get angry and attack our poor agents. How will you have them protect you? The chamber cuts down their salaries every day, so that they now have scarcely any. Will you be Ambassador Albert? Will I send you to Constantinople? No. Lest the first demonstration I make in favour of Mehmet Ali, the Sultan, send me the bowstring, and make my secretary strangle me. You say very true, responded Debray. Yes, said Albert, but this has nothing to do with the existence of the Count of Monte Cristo. Pardieu, everyone exists. Doubtless, but not in the same way. Everyone has not black slaves, a princely retinue, an arsenal of weapons that would do credit to an Arabian fortress, horses that cost 6,000 francs apiece, and a Greek mistress. Have you seen the Greek mistress? I have both seen her and heard her. I saw her at the theatre, and heard her one morning when I breakfasted with the Count. He eats then? Yes, but so little it can hardly be called eating. He must be a vampire. Laugh, if you will. The Countess G, who knew Lord Ruthven, declared that the Count was a vampire. Ah, <laughs> capital, said Beecham. For a man not connected with newspapers, he is the pendant of the famous sea serpent of the Constitutional. Wild eyes, the irises of which contracts or dilates at pleasure, said Debray. Facial angle strongly developed, magnificent forehead, livid complexion, black beard, uh, sharp and white teeth. Politeness, unexceptionable. Just so, Lucian, returned Morsef. You have described him feature for feature. Yes, keen and cutting politeness. This man has often made me shudder. And one day that we were viewing an execution, I thought I should faint, more from the cold and calm manner in which he spoke of every description of torture than from the sight of the executioner and the culprit. Did he not conduct you to the ruins of the Colosseum and suck your blood? asked Beecham. <laughs> or, having delivered you, make you sign a flaming parchment, surrendering your soul to him as Esau did his birthright? Rail on, rail on at your ease, gentlemen, said Morsef, somewhat piked. When I look at you Parisians, idlers on the Boulevard de Grand or the Bois de Boulange, and think of this man, it seems to me that we were not of the same race. I am highly flattered, returned Beecham. At the same time, added Chateau Renard, your Count of Monte Cristo is a very fine fellow, always accepting his little arrangements with the Italian banditti. There are no Italian banditti, said Debray. No vampire, cried Beecham. No Count of Monte Cristo, added Debray. There's half past ten striking, Albert. Confess you have dreamed this and let us sit down to breakfast, continued Beecham. But the sound of the clock had not died away when Germain announced, His Excellency the Count of Monte Cristo. The involuntary start that everyone gave proved how much Morsef's narrative had impressed them, and Albert himself could not wholly refrain from manifesting sudden emotion. He had not heard a carriage stop in the street, or steps in the antechamber. The door itself had opened noiselessly. The Count appeared, dressed with the greatest simplicity, but in the most fastidious dandy could have found nothing to cavail in his toilet. 
Every article of dress, hat, coat, gloves and boots were from the first makers. He seemed scarcely five and thirty, but what struck everyone was extreme resemblance to the portrait de Bray had shown. The Count advanced, smiling into the centre of the room, and approached Albert, who hastened towards him, holding out his hand in a ceremonial manner. Punctuality, said Monte Cristo, is the politeness of kings, according to one of your sovereigns, I think, but not always the same as with travellers. However, I hope you will excuse the two or three seconds I am behind hand. Five hundred leagues are not to be accomplished without some trouble, especially in France, where, it seems, it is forbidden to beat the postilions. My dear Count, replied Albert, I was announcing your visit to some of my friends whom I had invited in consequence of the promise you did honour me to make, and whom I now present to you. They are the Count of Chateau Renard, whose nobility goes back to the Twelve Peers, and whose ancestors had a place at the round table. Monsieur Lucien de Bray, private secretary to the Minister of the Interior, Monsieur Beecham, an editor of the paper, and the terror of the French government, but of whom, in spite of his national celebrity, you perhaps have not heard of in Italy, since his paper is prohibited there, and Monsieur Maximilien Morel, captain of Saphis. At this name, the Count, who had hitherto saluted everyone with courtesy, but at the same time with coldness and formality, stepped a pace forward, with a slight tinge of red colour in his pale cheeks. You wear the uniform of the new French conquerors, Monsieur, said he. It is a handsome uniform. No one could have said what caused the Count's voice to vibrate so deeply, and what made his eye flash, which was in general so clear, lustrous, and limpid when he pleased. You've never seen our Africans, Count, said Albert. Never, replied the Count, who was by this time perfectly master of himself again. Well, beneath this uniform beats one of the bravest and noblest of hearts in the whole army. Oh, Monsieur de Morcerf, interrupted Morel. L let me go on, Captain. And we have just heard, continued Albert, of a new deed of his, and so heroic a one, that, although I have seen him day to day for the first time, I request you allow me to introduce him to you as my friend. At these words, it was still possible to observe in Monte Cristo the concentrated look, changing colour and slight trembling of the eyelid that show emotion. Ah, you have a noble heart, said the Count. So much the better. This exclamation, which corresponded to the Count's own thought rather than to what Albert was saying, surprised everyone, especially Morel, who looked at Monte Cristo in wonder. But, at the same time, the intonation was so soft, however strange that the speech might seem, it was impossible to be offended by it. Why should he doubt it? said Beecham to Chateau Renard. In reality, replied the latter, who, with his aristocratic glance and knowledge of the world, had penetrated at once all that was penetrable in Monte Cristo. Albert has not deceived us, for the Count is a most singular being. What say you, Morel? Ma foi, he has an open look about him that pleases me in spite of the singular remark he made about me. Gentlemen, said Albert, Germain informs me that breakfast is ready. My dear Count, allow me to show you the way. They passed silently into the breakfast room, and everyone took his place. Gentlemen, said the Count, seating himself, permit me to make a confession which must form my excuse for any improprieties I may commit. I am a stranger, and a stranger to such a degree, that this is the first time I have ever been at Paris. The French way of living is utterly unknown to me, and up to the present time I have followed the Eastern customs, which are entirely in contrast to the Parisian. I beg you, therefore, to excuse me if you find anything in me too Turkish, too Italian, or too Arabian. Now, let us breakfast. With what an air he says all this, muttered Beecham. Decidedly, he's a great man. A great man in his own country, added Debray. A great man in every country, said Chateau Renard. The Count was, it may be remembered, a most temperate guest. Albert remarked this, expressing his fears lest, at the outset, the Parisian mode of life should somehow displease the traveller in the most essential point. My dear Count, said he, I fear one thing, and that is that the fare of the Rue de Helder is not much to your taste as that of the Piazza di Spagni. I ought to have consulted you on the point, and have some dishes prepared expressly. Did you know me better, replied the Count, smiling. You would not have given one thought to such a thing for a traveller like myself, who has successfully lived on macaroni at Naples, polenta in Milan, uh, Ola Pareda in Valencia, 
Pilau at Constantinople, uh, Carrick in India, <laughs> and Swallow's Nests in China. I eat everywhere, and of everything I only eat but a little. And today, that you reproach me with my want of appetite, is my day of appetite, for I have not eaten a thing since yesterday morning. What? cried all the guests. You've not eaten for four and twenty hours. No, replied the Count. I was forced to go out of my road to obtain some information near Nimes, so that I was somewhat late, therefore I did not choose to stop. And you ate in your carriage? asked Morsef. No, I slept, as I generally do when I am weary without having the courage to amuse myself, when I am hungry without feeling inclined to eat. But you can sleep when you please, Monsieur, said Morel. Yes. You have a recipe for it? An infallible one. That would be invaluable to us in Africa, who have not always any food to eat and rarely anything to drink. Yes, said Monte Cristo, but unfortunately, a recipe excellent for a man like myself would be very dangerous when applied to an army, which might not awake when it was needed. May we inquire what is in this recipe? asked Debray. Oh yes, returned Monte Cristo. I make no secret of it. It's a mixture of excellent opium, which I fetched myself from Canton in order to have it pure, and the best hashish which grows in the east, uh, that is, between the Tigris and the Euphrates. These two ingredients are mixed in equal portions and formed into pills. Ten minutes after one is taken, the effect is produced. Uh, ask Baron Franz d'Epinay. I think he tasted them one day. Yes, said Morsef. He said something about it to me. But, said Beecham, who as become a journalist, was very incredulous. You always carry this drug about you? Always. Would, would it be an indiscretion to ask to see these precious pills? Continued Beecham, hoping to take him at a disadvantage. No, monsieur, replied the Count. And he drew from his pocket a marvellous casket, formed of a single emerald and closed by a golden lid which unscrewed and gave passage to a small greenish-coloured pellet the size of a pea. The ball had an acrid and penetrating odour. There were four or five more in the emerald, which would contain about a dozen. The casket was passed around the table, but it was more to examine the admirable emerald than to see the pills that it passed from hand to hand. And it's your cook who prepares these pills? Oh, no, monsieur, replied Monte Cristo. I do not thus betray my enjoyments to the vulgar. I am a tolerable chemist and prepare the pills myself. This is a magnificent emerald, and the largest I have ever ever seen, said Chateau Renard, although my mother has some fairly remarkable family jewels. I had three similar ones, returned Monte Cristo. I gave one to the Sultan, who mounted it in his sabre, another to our Holy Father, the Pope, who had it set in his tiara, um, opposite one nearly as large, though not so fine, given by the Emperor Napoleon to his predecessor, uh, Pius VII. I kept the third for myself, and had it hollowed out, which reduced its value, but rendered it more commodious for the purpose I intended. Everyone looked at Monte Cristo with astonishment. He spoke with such simplicity that it was evident that he spoke the truth, or that he was mad. However, the sight of the emerald made them naturally inclined to the former belief. And what did these two sovereigns give you in exchange for these magnificent presents? asked Debray. Uh, the Sultan, the liberty of a woman replied the Count, the Pope, the life of a man, so that once in my life I would have been as powerful as if heaven had brought me into the world on the steps of a throne. And it was Peppino that you saved, was it not? cried Morsef. For it was him that you obtained a pardon. Perhaps, returned the Count, smiling. My dear Count, you have no idea what pleasure it gives me to hear you speak thus, said Morsef. I had announced to you beforehand, to my friends, an encounter of the Arabian Nights, a wizard of the Middle Ages, but the Parisians are so subtle in paradoxes that they mistake for caprices the imagination of the most incontestable truths, when the truths do not form a part of their daily existence. For example, here is Debray who reads, and Beecham who prints every day, a member of the jockey club has been stopped and robbed on the boulevard, four persons have been assassinated in the Rue Saint-Denis, or... At the Faubourg Saint Germain, ten, fifteen, or twenty thirties have been arrested in the Cafe de Boulevard de Temple, or in the Thermes de Julien. Yet these same men deny the existence of the bandits in the Maremma, uh, the Campagna di Romana, or the Pontine Marshes. Tell them yourself 
that I was taken by bandits, and that without your generous intercession, I would have now been sleeping in the catacombs of St. Sebastian instead of receiving them in my humble abode in the Rue de Heller. Ah, said Monte Cristo, you promised me never to mention that circumstance. It was not I who made that promise, cried Morsef. It must have been someone else whom you rescued in the same manner, and whom you have forgotten. Pray speak of it, for I shall not only, I trust, relate the little I do know, but also the great deal I do not know. It seems to me, returned the Count, smiling, that you have played a sufficiently important part to know as well as myself what happened. Well, you promised me, if I tell all I know, to relate in your turn, all that I do not know? That's but fair, replied Monte Cristo. Well, said Morsef, for three days I believed myself the object of the attentions of a mask, who I took for a descendant of Tilia or Papia, uh, while I was simply the object of the attentions of the Contadina, and I say Contadina to avoid saying peasant girl. What I know is, like a fool, a greater fool than he, of whom I spoke just now, I mistook for this peasant girl, a young bandit of fifteen or sixteen, with a beardless chin and a slim waist, and who, just as I was about to imprint a chaste salute on his lips, placed a pistol on my head, and, aided by seven or eight others, led, or rather dragged me, to the catacombs of St. Sebastian, where I found a highly educated brigand perusing Caesar's commentaries, and who deigned to leave off reading to inform me that unless the next morning before six o'clock, four thousand piastres were paid to his account at the banker's, at a quarter past six I should have ceased to exist. The letter is still to be seen, for it is in Franz de Epinay's possession, signed by me, and with the postscript of Monsieur Luigi Vampa. Uh, that's all I know, but I know not, Count, how you contrive to inspire so much respect in the bandits of Rome, who ordinarily have so little respect for anything. I assure you, France and I were lost in an admiration. Nothing more simple, returned the Count. I had known the famous Vampa for more than ten years. While he was quite a child and only a shepherd, I gave him a few gold pieces for showing me the way, and he, in order to repay me, gave me a poignard, uh, the hilt of which he had carved with his very own hand, which you may have seen in my collection of arms. In after years, whether he'd forgotten this interchange of presents, which ought to have cemented our friendship, or whether he did not recollect me, he sought to take me, but, on the contrary, it was I who captured him and a dozen of his band. I might have handed them over to Roman justice, which is somewhat expeditious, which would have been particularly to do so with him, but I did nothing of the sort. I suffered him and his band to depart. With the condition that they should sin no more, said Beecham, laughing, I see they kept their promise. No, monsieur, returned Monte Cristo, upon the simple condition that they should respect myself and my friends. Perhaps what I am about to say may seem strange to you, you who are socialists, and vaunt humanity and your duty to your neighbour, but I never seek to protect a society which does not protect me, and which, I will even say, generally occupies itself about me only to injure me, and thus by giving them a low price in my esteem and preserving a neutrality towards them. It is society and my neighbour who are indebted to me. Bravo, cried Chateau Renard. You are the first man I have ever met sufficiently courageous to preach egotism. Bravo, Count, bravo. It is frank, at least, said Morel. But I am sure that the Count does not regret having once deviated from the principles he so boldly avowed. How have I deviated from these principles, Monsieur? Asked Monte Cristo, who could not help looking at Morel with such intensity that two or three times the young man had been unable to sustain that clear and piercing gaze. Why, it seems to me, replied Morel, that in delivering Monsieur de Morcerf, whom you did not know, you did good to your neighbour and to society. Of which he is the brightest ornament, said Beecham, drinking a glass of champagne. My dear Count, cried Morcerf, you are at fault. One of the most formidable logicians I know, and you must see it clearly proved, that, instead of being an egotist, you are a philanthropist. Uh, you call yourself an Oriental, uh, a Levantine, a Maltese, Indian, Chinese. Your family name is Monte Cristo. Sinbad the Sailor is your baptismal appellation. Yet, the first day you set foot in Paris, you instinctively display the greatest virtue, rather the chief defect of us eccentric Parisians. That is, 
You assume the vices you have not, and you conceal the virtues you possess. My dear Vicomte, returned Monte Cristo, I do not see in all that I have done uh, anything that merits, either from you or these gentlemen, the pretend eulogies that I have received. Uh, you are no stranger to me, for I knew from the time I gave up my two rooms to you, invited you to breakfast with me, lent you one of my carriages, witnessed the carnival in your company, and saw with you from a window in the Piazza del Popolo the execution that affected you so much that you nearly fainted. I will appeal to any of these gentlemen. Could I leave my guests in the hands of a hideous bandit, as you term him? Besides, you know, I had the idea that you could introduce me into some of the Paris salons when I came to France. You might some time ago have looked upon this resolution as a vague project, but today you see it was a reality, and you must submit to it under a penalty of breaking your word. I will keep it, returned Mor Morsef, but I fear that you will be much disappointed, accustomed as you are to picturesque events and fantastic horizons. Among us, you will not meet with any of those episodes to which your famous existence has so familiarised you. Our Chimbrazo is as Montmartre, uh, our Himalaya is Mont Valerian, our great desert is the plain of Grinnell, where they are now boring an artesian well to water the caravans. We have plenty of thieves, though not so many as is said, but the thieves stand more in the dread of policemen than the Lord. France is so prosaic and Paris so civilised a city that you will not find its 85 departments. I say 85 because I do not include Corsica. You will not find then, in these 85 departments, a single hill on which there is not a telegraph or a grotto on which the com commissary of police has not put a gas lamp. There is but one service I can render you, and for that I place myself entirely at your orders, that is, to present, or to make my friends present you, everywhere. Besides, you have no need of anyone to introduce you. With your name and your fortune and your talent, Monte Cristo bowed with a somewhat ironical st smile, you can present yourself everywhere and be well received. I can be more useful in one way or only. In, if knowledge of Parisian habits, or the means of rendering yourself comfortable, or the bazaars can assist, you may depend on me, to find you a fitting dwelling here. I do not dare offer to share in my apartments with you as I shared with you in Rome. I, who do not profess egotism, yet am an egotist par excellence, for, except myself, these rooms would not hold a shadow more, unless that shadow was feminine. Ah, said the Count, that's a most conjugal reservation. I recollect at Rome you said something of projected marriage. May I congratulate you? The affair is still in projection. And he who says in projection means already decided, said Debray. No, replied Morsef. My father is most anxious about it, and I hope, ere long, to introduce you, if not to my wife, at least to my betrothed, Mademoiselle Eugène Danglars. Eugène... Eugène Danglars, said Monte Cristo. Tell me, is not her father Baron Danglars? Yes, returned Morsef, a baron of new creation. What matter, said Monte Cristo, if he has rendered the state services which merit this distinction? Enormous ones, answered Beecham. Although in reality a liberal, he negotiated a loan of six millions for Charles X in uh, 1829, who made him a baron and chevalier of the Legion of Honor, uh, so that he wears the ribbon not, as you would think, in his waistcoat pocket, but at his buttonhole. Ah, interrupted Morsef, laughing. Beecham, Beecham. Keep that for Corsair or the Chivarali, but spare my future father-in-law before me. Then, returning to Monte Cristo, you just now spoke of his name as if you knew the Baron. I do not know him, returned Monte Cristo, but I shall probably soon make of his acquaintance, for I have a credit opened with him by the house of Richard and Blontz of London, uh, Arstein and Eccles of Vienna, and Thompson and French of Rome. As he pronounced the last two names, the Count glanced at Maximilian Morel. If the stranger expected to produce an effect on Morel, he was not mistaken. Maximilian started as if he had been electrified. Thompson and French, said he. Do you, do you know this house, monsieur? They are my bankers in the capital of the Christian world, returned the, the Count quietly. Can my influence with them be of any service to you? Oh, Count, you could assist me perhaps in researches which have been up to the present fruitless. This house in past years did our a great service, and has, I know not for what reason, 
always denied having rendered us this service. Well, I shall be at your orders, said Monte Cristo, bowing. But, continued Morsef, a propos of Danglars, we have strangely wandered from the subject. We are speaking of a suitable habitation for the Count of Monte Cristo. Come, gentlemen, let us all propose some place. Where shall we lodge this new guest of ours in the great city? For Borg Saint Germain, said Chateau Renard. The Count will find there a charming hotel with a court and garden. Bah, Chateau Renard, returned Debray. You only know your dull and gloomy Faubourg Saint Germain. Do not pay any attention to him, Count. Live in the Chaussee d'Autine. That's the real centre of Paris. Boulevard de l'Opera, said Beecham. The second floor, a house with a balcony. The Count will have all of his cushions of silver cloth bought there. And as he smokes his shiblauk, see all of Paris pass before him. You have no idea then, Morel? asked Chateau Renard. You do not propose anything. Oh, yes, replied the young man, smiling. On the contrary, I have one, but I expected the Count to be tempted by one of the brilliant proposals made to him, yet he's not replied to any of them. I, I will venture to offer him a suit of apartments uh, in a charming hotel, in Pompadour style, that my sister inhabited for a year, in the Rue Meslay. You have a sister? asked the Count. Yes, Monsieur, a most excellent sister. Married? Nearly nine years. Happy? asked the Count again. As happy as it is permitted for a human creature to be, replied Maximilian. She married the man she loved, who remained faithful to us in our family fortunes, Emmanuel Herbort. Monte Cristo smiled imperceptibly. I live there during my leave of absence, continued Maximilian, and I shall be, together with my brother-in-law Emmanuel, at the disposition of the Count whenever he thinks fit to honour us. One minute, cried Albert, without giving Monte Cristo a chance to reply. Take care, you're going to immure a traveller, Sinbad the sailor, a man who comes to see Paris. You're going to make a patriarch of him. Oh no, said Morel. My sister is five and twenty, my brother-in-law is thirty. They are gay, young and happy. Besides, the Count will be in his own house and only see them when he thinks fit to do so. Thanks, Monsieur, said Monte Cristo. I shall content myself with being presented to your sister and her husband, if you do me the honour of introducing me. But... I cannot accept the offer of any one of these gentlemen, since my habitation is already prepared. What? cried Morsef. You are then going to a hotel? That will be very dull for you. Was I so badly lodged at Rome? said Monte Cristo, smiling. Parbleu, at Rome you spent 50,000 piastres in furnishings in your apartment, but I presume that you are not disposed to spend a similar sum every day. It's not that which deterred me, replied Monte Cristo. But as I determined to have a house to myself, I sent on my valet de chambre, and he ought to have by this time have bought the house and furnished it. But then you have a valet de chambre who knows Paris, said Beecham. It's the first time he's ever been in Paris. He's black and cannot speak, returned Monte Cristo. It's Ali, cried Albert in the midst of the general surprise. Yes, Ali himself, um, my Nubian mute, whom you saw, I think, at Rome. Certainly, said Morsef. I rec recollect him perfectly. But how can you charge a Nubian to purchase a house and a mute to furnish it? He'll do everything wrong. Undeceive yourself, monsieur, replied Monte Cristo. I am quite sure that, on the contrary, he will choose everything I wish. He knows my tastes, my caprices, my wants. He's been here a week. And with the instinct of a hound, hunting by himself, he will arrange everything for me. He knew that I should arrive today at ten o'clock. He was waiting for me at nine at the Barriere de Fontainebleau. He gave me this paper. It contains the number of my new abode. Read it yourself. Monte Cristo passed a paper to Albert. Ah, that is really original, said Beecham. And very princely, added Chateau Renard. What, you do not know your house? asked Debray. No, said Monte Cristo. I told you I did not wish to be behind my time. I dressed myself in the carriage and descended at the Viscount's door. The young men looked at each other. They did not know if it was a comedy Monte Cristo was playing, but every word he uttered had such an air of simplicity that it was impossible to suppose what he said was false. Besides, why should he tell a falsehood? We must content ourselves, then, said Beecham, with rendering the Count all the little services in our power. I, in my quality of a journalist, open all the theatres to him. Thanks, monsieur, returned Monte Cristo. My steward has taken orders to take a box at each theatre. Is your steward also a Nubian? asked Debray. No, he is a countryman of yours. If a Corsican is a countryman of anyone's. 
but you know him, Monsieur de Morcerf? Is that excellent Monsieur Bertuccio, who understood hiring windows so well? Yes, you saw him the day I had the honour of receiving you. He's been a soldier, a smuggler, everything, in fact. I would not be quite sure that he has not been mixed up with the police for some, some trifle. A stab with a knife, for instance. And you have chosen this honest and citizen as your steward, said Debray. Of how much does he rob you every year? On my word, replied the Count, no more than any other. I am sure he answers my purpose, knows no impossibility, so I keep him. Then, continued Chateau Renard, since you have an establishment, a steward, and a hotel in the Champs Elysees, you only want a mistress. Albert smiled. He thought of the fair Greek he had seen in the Count's box at Argentina and valet theatres. I have something better than that, said Monte Cristo. I have a slave. You procure your mistresses from the opera, the vaudeville or the varieties. I purchase mine at Constantinople. It costs me more, but I have nothing to fear. But you forget, replied Debray, laughing, that we Franks, by name and nature, as King Charles said, that the moment that she puts her foot in France, your slave becomes free. Who will tell her? The first person who sees her. She only speaks Romanic. That is different. But we at least shall see her, said Beecham. Do you keep eunuchs as well as mutes? Oh no, replied Monte Cristo. I do not carry brutalism so far. Everyone who surrounds me is free to quit me, and when they leave me they will no longer have any need of me or anything else, for it is that reason perhaps they do not quit me. They had long since passed to dessert and cigars. My dear Albert, said De Bray, rising, it is half past two. Your guest is charming, but you leave the best company to go to the worst sometimes. I must return to the minister's. I'll tell him of the Counts, and we shall soon know who he is. Take care, returned Albert. No one's been able to accomplish that. Oh, we have three millions for our police. It's true that they are almost always spent beforehand, but no matter, we still have 50,000 francs to spend for this purpose. And when you know, you will tell me? I promise you. Au revoir, Albert. Gentlemen, good morning. As he left the room, Debray called out loudly, My carriage! Bravo, said Beecham to Albert. I shall not go to the chamber, but I have something better to offer my readers than the speech of Monsieur Danglars. For heaven's sake, Beecham replied Morsef, do not deprive me of the merit of introducing him everywhere. Is he not peculiar? He's more than that, replied Chateau Renard. He's one of the most extraordinary men I saw in my life. Are you coming, Morel? Directly. I've given my card to the Count, who promises to pay us a visit at the Rue saint Mousse number 14. Be sure I shall not fail to do so, returned the Count before bowing, and Maximilien Morel left the room with Baron Chateau Renard, leaving Monte Cristo alone with Morcerf. End of chapter 40